Good evening. My name's Anthony Spira and I'm the director of MK Gallery and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight. I assume that we're all only too well versed in Zoom etiquette by now, but hopefully everything will go smoothly and at least we don't have to worry about the fire exits. Uh, this event is the second in a series called How to Improve Inclusion, Diversity and Belonging in Milton Keynes. The focus of the discussion tonight is disability, sensory impairment and neurodivergence. The aim is to bring together some key thinkers from a range of different backgrounds, including those with lived experience and those who provide services in support of access and inclusion. We intend this to be a very informal, open discussion, and we hope it will lead to further conversations and connections around this important subject. Each speaker has been asked to introduce themselves and to give a short physical description before they start speaking for any viewers who have a visual impairment. It might take a moment between speakers as we adjust the technology so that BSL interpretation and live captioning are visible to everyone. This is the first time I think that we've done this, so thank you for your patience and hopefully it'll all work out. In terms of my appearance, I'm a 40 something year old white man with a slightly shaggy lockdown look, lengthening floppy brown hair, an increasingly salt and pepper beard, frameless glasses, and I'm sitting in a small white but dark room. Before handing over to our first speaker, I'd like to share a few thoughts from the gallery's perspective. Our aspiration is certainly to be accessible to all in every way possible, and we're always trying to improve in that regard. I think it's fair to say that we subscribe to the social model of disability, which says that people are disabled by barriers in society, not by their impairment or difference. Barriers can be physical, like buildings not having accessible toilets, or they can be caused by attitudes towards difference, like assuming disabled people can't do certain things. This model, as opposed to the medical model, which says that people are disabled by their impairments or differences, helps us to recognise barriers that make life harder for disabled people so that we can try to remove those barriers. A, a big step in that direction for us at the gallery was the inclusion of a Changing Places facility as part of our new building, which opened in 2019. This is a facility that includes a hoist, shower, screen, adult sized changing bench and adjustable basin, all crucially in a room that's big enough to turn an electric buggy. Although I think there's only one other in the whole of central Milton Keynes, we learned that 8,000 people in our catchment area require those facilities. In fact, there was a mind blowing article by Francis Ryan in the Guardian in 2018, which I really strongly recommend you read that pointed out that there are 250,000 disabled people in the UK who can't use standard accessible toilets. It also pointed out that there are only 1,300 changing places facilities across the whole country. Thankfully, some progress is being made slowly, but we're proud to be able to offer this facility at MK Gallery and to be able to develop programmes around it. So we're extremely grateful to the Milton Keynes Community Foundation for enabling this and so many other crucial projects across the city. Another key moment in the gallery's pro process towards improving access was the creation in 2018 of the new role of Curator of Inclusion. Since her appointment, my brilliant colleague Bethany Mitchell has been running Art and Us, our weekly programme of art activities for families with children aged five or more who have complex needs. Bethany won a national award for excellence in education and the arts. And before the first lockdown last March, there was a waiting list for families as we'd reached capacity. Again, this program was very generously funded by the Community Foundation. And I'm delighted that we'll be hearing from their CEO, Ian Rebel shortly, and the Paul Hamlin Foundation. And right now we're in the process of fundraising in order to extend and expand this program for a further four years. Uh, in addition to Art and Us, we've organised a whole range of relaxed events, screenings and tours for local communities and families, and we can't wait until it's safe to do so again. I was also particularly happy that we were able to organise a two-day conference in 2019 with a broad range of national partners, including Action Space, Into Art and Disability Arts Online, that aimed to place neurodiverse artists at the centre of the conversation. This conference came out of an important partnership 
with project artworks, an organisation in Hastings who we've worked with for over 10 years and who, who've been particularly inspirational to me personally. Some of you might remember uh, the exhibition States and Spaces, which was a survey of their work, which we held at MBA Gallery in 2012. Uh, the broad intention of that project was for us to learn about the impact of our built environment from neurodivergent people or those with perceptual impairment. The central theme of the project referenced the urban grid of Milton Keynes uh, and a camera was flown from a blimp anchored to the roof of the gallery and its view beamed into the workshops. And we also included recordings from a series of pedestrian journeys across the city. But the project really offered insights uh, into the worlds of people who have neurological impairments and their very particular ways of experiencing different spaces. But also crucially, it provided direct and honest accounts of experiences that affect us all to differing degrees. And it brings me to an extraordinary film made by Project Artworks that we included in our inaugural ex exhibition in 2019, The Lie of the Land. One of the main themes in that show was how people have been excluded from the landscape and representations of the landscape for a number of reasons, whether related to class, race, gender, disability, etc. This film, called Illuminating the Wilderness, documented a trip to a very remote forest in the Highlands with a group of artists, neurodivergent adults, their carers and families. It was nominated last year for a prestigious Jarman Award a real milestone in propelling autistic people's lived experience into mainstream success. However, a review in The Guardian appeared to dismiss the trampling, blowing, rocking, and indecipherable chatter as problematic. So I was really grateful to read a response online from Sonia Bue, a professional artist who also has autism. She had absolutely nothing to do with the film herself, but she wrote, on her blog. This film speaks to me in my language. This is my sensory world. Our immersive connection to the sensory world can feel vast and expansive. It is beyond words. This is supremely exciting to us and joyfully fulfilling. And I hope this hasn't taken us too far into the abstract. I I just wanted to underline some of our motivations in seeking increased diversity, genuine inclusion and improved access. That it's a priority for the gallery to encourage and present different perspectives and to learn from them. As one of my favourite artists, Jean Dubuffet, suggested, the real function of art is to change mental patterns, making new thought possible. And on that note, I'd like to hand over to gallery trustee Fidel Mutwarasibo, who plays such an important role in reminding us of the need to reach outside of our comfort zone. Thank you very much. And Fidel, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. I'm not sure what I'm going to add to your great presentation. As you said, my name is Fidel Mutwarasibo. I am a trustee at MK Gallery. Uh, a bit new and I'm on a learning curve. So when I was asked to join the board of trustees, my question was, I'm not an artist know nothing about art why me it transpired i needed a new challenge and mk gallery needed a new challenge so that's how the relationship was born so uh, they asked me to contribute to the work on uh, equality diversity and inclusion and since i joined not too long ago Let's definitely one year ago, after the lockdown, I have been thinking about how we can expand our reach of the gallery 
to make sure that even people like myself who have very little knowledge or expertise in art can identify ourselves with the gallery. It is with this in mind that last year, during the Black History Month, we had our first discussion group, our first informal meeting where we met people who in uh, legal speak would fall in a various category or protected group. And it was a beginning, it wasn't an end. So today we are talking about disability and what society is doing to make sure that we are all included as Anthony said. But this is not the end. We will try and cover as many protected categories as possible. And when it is done, we also have to reflect on intersectionality because we know that, uh, you know, those protected categories are not fixed. They are dynamic and people can be in one or more categories. We, in a way, uh, are on a journey where we hope to use these workshops as a way of gaining information, building up relationship, and getting people to work with us as we try to make uh, the gallery uh, more inclusive and more caring for all people of Milton Keynes, irrespective of their backgrounds. So I will not be taking long in terms of speaking because uh, it, it's for you, it's for our speakers and for our audience rather than for me, except that I'm delighted to be here. I have my uh, notebook here, so I'll take some notes to make sure that uh, I remind Anthony that uh, we had a workshop and a few ideas emerged let's do something about them. We'll be realistic. We can't promise mountains, but at the same time, we see this as a relationship which we have to build upon, nurture, and uh, help and support everybody as we move forward. Uh, hopefully, uh, when we reopen, we, we can meet in the space. Uh, as opposed to meeting virtually, because uh, it would have been great to meet with uh, everyone in everyone in uh, one space. But unfortunately, we are where we are, and we have technology to help us out. I think I will stop here, and uh, uh, we'll come back later when we are in the process of finishing to sum up what I get from this event. And uh, uh, the floor is uh, to the next speaker. Right, good evening all. Um, let me introduce myself first. I'm Ernie Boddington, the Chair of Trustees of Milton Keynes Centre for Integrated Living, also known as CIL or SIL, depending on what you know. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are a free-to-use pan-disability advice and information and support charity. Um, been running for in excess of 25 years and normally help around about 1,500 people a year. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I should hate to add on that. Um, regarding myself, um, I'm a visually impaired. I'm a white male over 70. I'm 173 centimetres, 5 foot 8 in English, just to give you a clue of my size. Um, I'd like to think I'm solid, but most people will probably say I'm stocky or even slightly obese. Um, thinning hair, or in fact, in reality, probably gone. <laughs> hair. Um, for the hearing impaired, I'm London born and bred, and I've worked there all my working life for over 40 years, as my voice probably told you. Uh, I'm an engineer, because I think that actually what people do gives you a clue of what you're you what look like physically. Like if I told you I was a professional rugby player, you'll get a different image than if I told you I was a ballet dancer. Um, 
I said, I'm an engineer. Um, for those who don't know that an engineer is beyond those who just happen to pick up a spanner. I was an electrical power engineer to start with and then became a station and tunnel services engineer. The tunnel bit gives you a clue. I work for London Underground. On top of that, I'm a, well, was I, qualified football coach and referee. So from that, you can tell I, I like to tell people what to do. Um, in terms of, oh, I suppose I should add, I'm also mobility impaired myself. Um, in terms of turning to what I would most like to talk about is accessibility. But as Anthony was quoting some stats, um, disability has no, is totally indiscriminate, has no discrimination whatsoever. It, across, it affects across the protected group with 40% of the population being disabled. Um, if we extrapolate that to Milton Keynes, it means there's probably around about 58,000 disabled people in Milton Keynes. If you add to that the fact that most aged people, like myself, um, don't see that they, the effect of ageing is a disability, it's probably closer to a third of the population are disabled. Um, and in terms of accessibility and the need for a colleague of mine once said, there's only two types of people in the country or in the world, those that are disabled and those that are not yet disabled. I became moved from the not yet disabled to the disabled after I retired, virtually more or less on the day I retired, but not quite. Um, but I had worked on accessibility before in my working environment. So it's something fairly near and dear to my heart. So what I would like to say very briefly, because it doesn't take long to say, is the four L's of accessibility. Let me get there around and about, which means fully accessible transport, but is spontaneous. I don't have to phone up to get somebody to be there with a ramp or anything else. I can just go and get on it when I feel like it. A fully accessible public realm. Now that is, has so many different terminologies. You can have it as street scene, um, pedestrian area, public place, whatever, but that needs to be totally accessible as well so that people can go around and get in anywhere when they want to. Milton Keynes has a lot of, public, uh, of parks areas, places like that, but it is pointless if you can't get into them in the first place. So, again, it needs to be worked on. The second L is let me in. So we need accessible public buildings, not just the threshold, but everything about them, the facilities, the communications, and the rest of it. Also accessible housing. I won't take Kerry's thunder away from her, I don't suppose, but um, we need to be able to get into our friends' houses. And if I say to start with a no more on housing, Kerry, that only 9% of housing is accessible. 9%. It's not a lot, is it? Or more relevantly, 90% isn't. The third L is let me participate. Let me sit at the table. So that the facilities are provided to enable me to communicate that suitably enable input. It could be written, it could be communication systems within the meeting room, it could be a website. Web accessibility is becoming a big thing lately. How many people, how many websites are there that are to the World Wide Web Consortium Standard 2, which is the minimum considered accessible? And finally, the fourth L is listen. We're either experts by experience or otherwise we have the knowledge. I could have talked to you about accessibility before I came disabled, but I see it in a different light now than I did before. In terms of how are we going to do it? Well, by cajoling Milton Keynes Council the business community and relevant others into addressing the issue. Now, this might sound a bit uh, 
bit of a long stretch. But if I add that our neighbouring town in Bedford declared itself an inclusive town 18 months ago. I know that because I'm part of the committee over there and I live in Bedford. And that even with the pandemic, a lot of workers move forward. So if at the minimum we can set from this a base camp where we can go forward and then start to climb the mountain. That will do from me. I hope that's inside the five minutes anyway. And I'll pass to uh, the next speaker, Amanda. Hi everybody, good evening. My name's Amanda, as you can see. Um, a bit about me, I am a, a writer, a disability campaigner and activist. Um, I am also a member of the Women's Equality Party and um, nationally and in Milton Keynes and I'm co-chair of their disability caucus uh, nationally. Uh, in terms of a physical description, um, I'm a, uh, I've got dark brown hair, I'm wearing uh, frameless glasses. I'm extremely small. I'm only four foot eight when standing. And as I can't stand anymore, I won't. Um, and I'm wearing an orange dress, a woolen orange dress, because I'm freezing. Uh, I hope that will do. I also have, I have an invisible disability, which is um, no short-term memory due to brain damage. So I will be referring to my notes because I don't want to forget what I need to say to you. But before I start, I want to read this poem to you. It's called China Doll. It's very relevant to what I'm gonna say afterwards. She was beautiful, long dark plaits with red ribbons framed her white face, big saucer-like deep blue eyes and long spider legs lashes perfect rosebud shaped red mouth. She wore a black velvet dress with a delicate lace collar and cuffs at her tiny wrists. She wore red tights to match her ribbons and patent black shoes with straps to match her dress. They were very shiny. Mother and father had been given her as a gift, mother always said. Father never looked very sure. They called her China Doll. She sat on one end of the mantelpiece, over the big open fire, taking pride of place in the sitting room. Everyone noticed her. No one was allowed to play with her. Too delicate, Mother would say. Made of por porcelain, Father explained. At night, when the door closed for the very last time, no one was there to see the tears trickle down her cheek or her fervent prayer to whoever might be listening that one day she might just be to someone more than a china doll. Now that poem for me is, is very pertinent to what I want to talk to you about because I want to talk about language and perception, otherwise called chicken and egg as far as I'm concerned, because how we perceive things is then how we relate to them and then how we talk about them. So people with disabilities, I think, uh, uh, often experience a lot of ambivalence. Um, we're, we're often underestimated, seen as helpless, as in the China doll, seen as vulnerable, dependent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when we're not being seen as those things, we have what I call inspiration porn, which I detest. I have a couple of friends who I was speaking to about my, uh, what I was doing tonight, and um, was talking to them about the inspiration thing. And they're, Paraly they're Paralympian Olympian athletes. And they didn't see what they did as particularly outstanding or heroic. They trained really hard to be good at what they were good at. And I think for me, that's, that's the point. M most of us are not heroes. We're not inspirational. Uh, trust me, if you could see my carer getting me out of bed in the morning you'd know I wasn't inspirational it's it's about being accepted for who we are which is about what this is about it's about inclusion diversity and how we get to a sense of belonging 
So the poem is filled with implicit and explicit ableism, if you like, the way we talk. You know, we, we talk about standing for parliament. We talk about running for office. We talk about, uh, do, you, do you get my drift? Um, we're littered, we all do it. It's not just people without disabilities. I do it. It's, it's very normalized and we internalize that from very small children. The difference between the way people, people with disabilities are perceived by children rather, rather than adults is I, I can remember being governor of uh, chair of governors at a local school in Milton Keynes and I went in to teach the children to read and write as you do and nobody said a word about my wheelchair nobody not a word and I went into the staff room one day and I said what is wrong with these children why have they not noticed that I'm in a wheelchair and it, it that's how how it affects me growing up in a very ableist society I expect to be stared at and um, pitied and all those other things and then the next week I went in and the children's uh, one of the children said Mrs Carter Philpot would you like me to move a chair and another one of the children I think the, the staff had paid them to say this said why are you in a wheelchair so you know it was a bit coincidental which I don't believe in and so I said oh because I had a fall I was actually born disabled but I could walk up until 12 13 years ago and when I said oh I'm in a chair because I had a fall they just went carried on and asked me to help them read they, they they're very accepting of things that are, are explained very simply they don't have our prejudices and our our ableist attitudes and our unconscious bias and I think for me I have a strategy for how we might deal with that in Milton Keynes uh, tackling diversity we've got the Equality Act now 2010 and yes we're one of the protected characteristics and yes um, particularly in employment and what have you, people have to have their quota of diversity. I don't want to be a tick box for diversity. I want to be employed because I'm damn good at what I do. And, it, 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 and if that's a way through the door, then that's fine. But it's no good ticking the box for diversity if you then don't include me in anything you do thereafter. Um, so I have a strategy for, uh, for dealing with this. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna read it to you. The first thing is, is that we all need to accept that we all make mistakes. My language is very ableist sometimes. It's, it's in here, it's in, I'm 59 years old and I've grown up in that world, it's in here. So we need to accept that we need an open environment where it's okay to make mistakes. We need to recognize that quotas do not equal inclusion. We need to have and to facilitate courageous conversations and challenges of which I see this evening as one of those. It's a conversation, we need to have lots of these and it's okay to say, oh, I didn't realize that or I didn't know about that. Um, it's not a one and done either to get from diversity to inclusion to belonging, which is the ultimate goal, it's a process and we're gonna make mistakes along the way and that has to be okay. It's what we do about those mistakes that count. We need to maximize the benefits of connection and we need to stop looking at, um, automatically looking at what people can't do and focus on what they can because disability has context. I'm sitting here talking to you now and I'm not at all disabled, as long as I can follow my notes, otherwise I'd forget what I was gonna say. But if I was out in the street, I might be. If I was going into, the shop, into a shop, I might be. But you might be equally disabled. Anthony might be disabled without his glasses, for example. Just, just small little things are really important to build up to these courageous conversations and to maximize our connections, minimize the fear of asking questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to be wrong so that we all thrive 
and not survive. And I like to think, because I am an eternal optimist, that we live in a society where people want to feel welcome and not be constricted by what they can and cannot do. And there are plenty of ways to, Ernie mentioned about challenging policies and so on and so forth. I'm all for challenge. And International Women's Day's theme this year is choose to challenge. So I would always choose to challenge policies and procedures that, that make our lives inaccessible so that we can actually become, in fact, COVID has, for some people with disabilities, it's opened up things because everybody's working from home now, almost everybody. And so it opens up possible opportunities. And I'm working with one of the local MPs on a policy for working at home, which will, I hope, broaden out employment opportunities for people with disabilities and won't cost the employer anymore because everything that the disabled person needs is already in their home. So I'll finish on that note. But I do think everything is possible as long as we don't forget nothing about us without us. Thank you. Hi there. Hi, lovely to see you all tonight. So my name's Sam Dorr. I'm 43. Unfortunately, I am bald. And I've got a bit of stubble today. I've got really big prominent eyebrows and I'm wearing a nice jumper with a film on it with a True Romance logo zone on it. So it's one of my favourite films. I'm in my kitchen, actually. Usually I'm in my office, but the Wi-Fi is not so great, so I thought I'd come in the kitchen tonight. Uh, if my cat does jump into the screen, I do apologise. So I'm a deaf filmmaker. I also do graphic design and photography. I'm originally from Bristol. Then I moved to London and I worked there for a long time. I met my wife. We got pregnant. And a baby decided, oh, do we want to stay in London? And then we've naturally moved to Sony Stratford. So I've now been here four years and I just love it. You know, it's a really great pace, nice way of living. And it's so close to Milton Keynes, there's still plenty to do. So I've been really working in media in really various environments, um, but I primarily focus on uh, short films and dramas and I do directing and writing. And uh, I tend to focus on deaf actors and deaf culture as well. But I do include hearing characters within my projects. Also I tend to focus on uh, film set photography. So that means I do go onto different film sets and take uh, films, photos on short films, documentaries and feature films. Locally, I worked for um, MK Literary Festival and uh, I did the photography for that. And I also did a short film uh, with a screening with uh, IF International Milton Keynes. That was a short film, lots of deaf short films that I curated there. So really what I wanted to talk about tonight is subtitling, uh, especially at the cinema. So I am an absolute deaf film buff. I love watching films, uh, I love making sure that everybody is the same, you know, and hearing people and deaf people have equal rights. When they go to a film, everybody should be able to watch it, understand it and enjoy it. So because I'm 43, it means I've been through all of the different technology from VHS, I can remember that, yeah. And they didn't have subtitles, well, they had limited subtitles. You had to get extra packages, a special box that you'd plug into the video and it was quite complicated to do that but the subtitles were really on limited things. So the films tended to be a lot more visual that I watched like Star Wars or Indiana Jones because I didn't need to know the story. I could watch it from a visual perspective. And then that I became used to not having subtitles as well. As I got older, 
I really started to study film much more in depth and I used to buy any of the published scripts so that I could read them as well as watching the film. And then when the films got books that were attached to them, I'd also buy them so I could learn everything. And I would just know exactly what was going to happen before I even saw the film. So I'd know before everyone, which is probably a shame, but there we go. But at least I knew what was going on. Nowadays, obviously we've got like digital media and wow, things have changed. The quality of subtitles have really, really improved, continuously improved. For example, now you've got digital programming uh, packages, you know, a hard drive with films, you can put that in and project, which means that you can add subtitles to that. And then straight away, you've got subtitles and it's automatic. In general, subtitle screenings of English speaking films are a little bit different because with foreign films, people accept it. You know, they know the subtitles are already going to be there. But for an English speaking film, that is where it's more important. At the moment, there's really limited choice about when I can go and see a screening. You know, it's usually in the week when everybody else is at work. I mean, I'm also at work. Um, I don't like to go in the day. I tend to go in the uh, evening. I do still have a job. And also, you know, maybe they're really late at night, just like too late. I've still got work tomorrow. So it's quite difficult. There's no perfect solution. And also you'll see maybe hearing people just like pop to the cinema whenever they're like, yeah, I'll go this day, this time, not me. I have to pick this specific day, the specific time that's got the subtitles and the specific place also. So there's no flexibility for us. So with English speaking films in mind, you know, when you've got big blockbuster films, they can have their own subtitles. But in the independent films, they rarely do have subtitles. With a big blockbuster film, you're going to get massive audiences. And obviously with the smaller films, they're not going to attract the same audiences and then also subtitles. I have been to cinemas before that have said they've got a screening. I went to a screening recently to see Saint Maud. And uh, that was a really small film and it had subtitles, which was a relief, but it was a really specific time of day. But, you know, I made my peace with it. Subtitle screenings every week, maybe just one or two. Hearing people have got plenty of options to when they can go to the cinema. You know, Friday nights, Saturday nights, can I go and watch a film and be with my friends and socialise? Very rarely, which seems unfair to me. So with the cinema subtitle screenings, the problems they've got is it's not very profitable. Audiences don't tend to like watching films with subtitles, which is a primary reason that they avoid putting them on. And then they know that not many people will attend if they do. So that's the reason for there being limited flexibility. If hearing people can go, they can go any time of day, but not for us. I have seen more and more hearing people go to subtitled films in the recent times. I think that might be, for example, not only deaf people going, but um, some people might be hard of hearing, maybe deafened, or perhaps maybe their first language isn't English and they'd like to go to watch a subtitle screening to start to understand English a bit more. At the moment, it seems like there is some growth to other hearing people going to watch see, uh, subtitle screens. Talking about inclusivity, as we all are tonight, I think that's something we definitely need to bear in mind. With subtitles, it makes everybody feel included. When you've got a film and there's a joke and everyone's laughing, it's nice to be laughing at the same time. It's nice to be shocked at the same time. You know, when there's story, there's a real big plot twist and I don't understand it. If I had the subtitles, I'd at least understand what the plot twist was and be able to include myself in the film. With other technology, there is new things now. We've got glasses, which you can put on, which do uh, put subtitles on for you as an individual. Uh, but if you don't have 20-20 vision, that can become quite difficult and give you headaches. And in America, they do actually have seats where you can pull out a small screen and there'll be subtitles on there. But you do have to obviously look down and up constantly, you know, able to fully enjoy the film. So it's best to have the subtitles directly on the screen along with the footage. At the moment, Technology is not perfect or fully accessible. I think it's fine. I think it's acceptable. 
you know, for a long time, I've always just accepted that it's fine as it is. It's fine. And I'll just deal with it. And I've, I've probably got used to it. So obviously I'm wrapping up now. I think the key thing I'd like to say is if you, if people are providing a film and if you can make a little bit of effort to provide subtitles for that film at the cinema or maybe people who are making a film, you know, they can add the subtitles at the time of making it. It will increase people going to watch it. I know it's added money and added cost, but potentially there's some added profit there. You'll be able to show your film to many more people. And it'll make everybody look good as well, look more accessible, look more welcoming. Deaf, hard and hearing, deaf and people can all enjoy it at the same time and socialise together. The problem that people do think with subtitles is that they think it's excessively difficult and it really isn't. It's not that expensive and it's not too much work. If you've already got a script, that can be pretty much popped into subtitles. So there is a little bit of work there, but that little bit of work tends to go a long way. So thank you very much for this evening and thank you for your time. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Polly Kempson. I am a deputy head at PACE in Aylesbury. And um, we're a school that specialises in working with children and young people with neurodisabilities. We work in a very transdisciplinary way, integrating therapy and education into a holistic curriculum with three key aims for our students. So hearing um, Anthony in his introduction talking about the social model and um, hearing Amanda talking about what people can do um, I think those those are really big um, things that influence the way that we work. So those three key things that we aim to achieve with our curriculum. The first one is for all our young people to gain orthofunction. That is to say that each child or young person feels a sense of agency in their own lives and are able to realise their potential and live a fulfilled life. We aim for our students to have access to the world uh, so that they have the skills to use available technologies to fully access the world around them. So we spend quite a bit of time um, ensuring that they get experience of such technologies and teaching them the skills to use them. Um, communication and social action, social interaction, I beg your pardon, is also a big driver for us. So important that each child develops their own voice and is able to express it, to build those social connections and be an active part of their community. So that's a little bit about what we sort of stand for as a school. Um, and the thing that I wanted to, to talk about this evening was um, organising a school trip. And so as deputy head teacher, that often forced me to start the organizing of our school trips. Now, I absolutely think it is of the most vital importance that our students all experience uh, an equivalent experience of school to any neurotypical child. Um, and so as such, we should be going out and about and visiting galleries and museums and parks and zoos and all sorts of exciting places um, for the students to experience the world around them. Um, and there are lots and lots of workshops that are aimed at the um, special needs and disability community. But interestingly, we find time and time again that our students with their physical disabilities are not really catered for. So, and it is those basics um, about, uh, uh, about organising a trip that stand in the way. So things like being able to meet the children's um, personal care and um, eating and drinking needs of a day out is really, really difficult. Now, I noted, Anthony, that you said at the introduction that you have one of these changing places, changing rooms. 
and and they are absolutely wonderful. Um, but uh, as you also said, very few places have them, which means that particularly our secondary students can really, really struggle because we need a hoist. We need an adult size changing bed to accommodate them. And if if we don't, if we can't have access to that, then you're really limited to going out for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, maybe you might risk, but certainly not out for the day. If we want to get a little bit further afield from Aylesbury, um, that, that is tricky also. Um, the other thing we find is lunch rooms. So the lunch room or the room that's set aside for school groups to use for lunch is often quite small. It's often several school groups there at the same time. So that it's very, very busy. Um, and we might not be able to access a microwave because there's a health and safety um, regulation in place that says that we can't use a microwave. Um, but a lot of our children and um, have dysphagia and actually have a modified diet. And so sandwiches are not on the cart. So it's these sorts of things which end up being a real frustration. Um, and, and I just, yes, I, th I think the frustration as well comes when actually you feel as if they would be relatively simple things to overcome. And if we could overcome them, we would open up this world um, to our students and probably more importantly, our students to the world, um, as it were, because I think that actually uh, we need to get out into the community with our students. And that's not just so that they experience the community, but so that the community experiences them as well. Their voices need to be part of that community. Uh, they should be seen, they should be heard, and they should be made space for. Um, so that, picking up, I think, Amanda, some of the points that you made, that actually their abilities, their, the, the knowledge, insight, ideas that they have to contribute to society um, get out there. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I was surprised when we uh, we only recently got a minibus. So this uh, allowed us to ramp up our school trip opportunities um, because that's another thing. Accessible transport is so expensive. Um, so eventually we've got our own minibus, but then find now actually quite limited by the places we can go and how long we can stay for. So um, some interesting things to think about there for people who are organising and putting on events for school children, um, particularly aimed at the SEND community there. Uh, just to finish on uh, the fact that actually I've had, uh, we have got a couple of families um, who have accessed quite a few things at um, MK Gallery and particularly wanted me to pass on how much they've enjoyed the um, quiet screenings and also the Art and Us project, which they found really, really valuable and really enjoyed. So um, maybe when this pandemic is all over or things have moved on at least, um, we will be able to come over as a school and um, and visit you and start up um, exploring things that you might have to offer there for us. Thank you. Hello, I uh, just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Angela Novell. Uh, I am the Chief Executive of MK SNAP. Uh, we're a leading disability charity based in Milton Keynes. Um, to describe myself, which I had quite a laugh with my husband about this afternoon, he gave me various uh, options that I could share. Um, but I'm a white uh, middle-aged woman. Um, I live with uh, bilateral moderate hearing loss. Um, so when Samuel was talking about films with subtitles, I was silently cheering um, that because uh, that, that's equally important to me as well. So I love to be able to read the subtitles. So thanks for raising that. Um, for me, I've worked in the charitable and community sector in Milton Keynes for the last 18 years. Um, so that's my background. Um, during my um, short time to speak this evening, you'll hear me refer to people with learning disabilities as well as disabled people. 
Um, and I just want to explain just from a language point of view, because it's a good point that Amanda makes that although at MK SNAP our learners are um, people with learning disabilities, um, what I've got to say this evening, I think, really applies to everybody that's living with any type of disability. So um, during these difficult and challenging times, we've all, I think, felt the impact um, of the pandemic. And we've all shared a, a range of unique lived experiences that emerge from times of great change and uncertainty, and particularly about loss and fear for the future. For people living with a learning disability, the impact of the pandemic has disproportionately impacted them. Um, we know this because we're hearing reports in the media, but also you know, information and intelligence that we have locally in, in our own area. In fact, in figures published this week by national disability charity MENCAP, um, people with a learning disability are seven times more likely to die from the virus than the general population, um, which is, is an awful and shocking statistic. And I think we need to remember as well that this is set against a landscape before the pandemic, where um, uh, even today in 2021, the health inequalities for people with learning disabilities means that they are likely to live significantly shorter lives than general population. And I think it's important to remember in these times where we're dominated by the pandemic that actually a lot of these issues were already there. So as I've said already, for people with a learning disability, the impact of the lockdown has brought isolation um, for many and a reduction in social contact and routines. And this has been really acute. Um, with services being suspended, many people have experienced a decline in their physical and mental health, uh, reduced mobility, loss of essential life skills and low self-esteem. And what we hear is that families and carers are facing challenging behaviour and frustration from their loved ones, which is understandable and kind of expected. Despite this, our vibrant and creative charities and voluntary sector organisations in Milton Keynes continue to find extraordinary and innovative ways to reach out and connect people. Like at MK Snap, where we're now delivering uh, online workshops across the week, thanks to support from Community Foundation. So thanks, Ian. Um, and that has meant that because we've adapted services, we've been able to meet new, new needs of people that we support. Uh, many of us, uh, I think it would be fair to say, um, have relied on the use of technology during the crisis. And this has created a huge spike in people using tech to help them with their work and everyday lives. It's something that many of us take totally for granted. However, this leap in using technology has really, for us, brought into sharp focus the digital skills gap for adults with learning disabilities. A lack of equipment and IT support at home is a real challenge and can be a barrier to access. Again, that echoes what Eddie was saying, um, uh, sorry, Ernie was saying earlier on about access being really important. Those that can stay digitally connected um, express the significant difference this makes to stimulating positive thinking, um, mental well-being, social skills and respite for exhausted parents and carers. Now, I'm sure that you'll join me in believing that there are solutions that can be found if we harness the passion and drive of caring citizens uh, and businesses in Milton Keynes. At MK Snap, we call our students learners and as a learner-led organization being able to connect with and listen to the voices of those that we support is at the very heart of what we do we remain ambitious that together in milton Keynes, we can transform the lives of people living with a learning disability and we celebrate this with events such as milton Keynes disability awareness day where we ask the community to join us in celebrating the incredible um, abilities and contributions of disabled people. 
as a community leader, I would ask that we seek to enable and support positive solutions to keep people living with disabilities connected in the following three simple ways. Number one, that we commit as individuals and organisations to work in partnership to support and sustain the many charitable and voluntary sector groups that provide vital networks for people with disabilities and their families. Number two would be that we call upon businesses and agencies to help bridge that digital gap for adults with disabilities by helping them with connectivity and accessible kit in a similar way to the way that schools are currently being supported through, through reuse and recycling of kits. And then number three, we call upon the community of Milton Keynes to be open to listen to the unique experiences and voices of people with disabilities so that they remain at the heart of shaping our community, focusing on their talents and contributions rather than their limitations. And finally, I'd just like to express my thanks to colleagues at Milton Keynes Gallery for providing this platform and for keeping the discussion about how we can improve the quality and diversity in Milton Keynes firmly on the agenda. Thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Ian Revel. I uh, work at the Milton Keynes Community Foundation. I'm their chief exec. I'm a white, mid fifties, thinking I'm thin, but actually quite plump man. Um, Grey haired, wear glasses, which are currently silver, but they were black. I've just peeled the paint off. And I'm in my uh, room next to the garden with a bookshelf behind me. It's the real bookshelf. I'm going to um, obviously speak this evening from the perspective of a funder. The foundation, Mental Health Community Foundation, uh, funds voluntary sector, community, cultural uh, groups in the borough of Milton Keynes. And last year, that was about £2.4 million. And um, I'm very proud over the uh, course of the pandemic, we have raised uh, £1.2 million, pounds, which um, we're spending as a result and to support the emergency and the recovery. The question I've been asked to think about, well, we've all been asked to think about, is that how we improve inclusion and diversity in Milton Keynes. Now, the foundation isn't a disability charity or, uh, uh, or, or, or a diversity charity. It supports all of the city. And we need to be very systematic, I think. Um, all organisations need to have a very systematic approach to change if we are going to improve diversity and inclusion. That's private, public and community organisations. We need to give support to groups that champion and are leading in diversity and inclusion. And this takes time, long-term strategy time. It takes resources of people within organisations. And it also, of course, takes money. It also um, means that we need to um, give authority to people to lead change. And we need to be challenged, organisations like the Foundation, so that we are identifying the challenges and obstacles from the outset, and that we're working with people, all people, to create solutions together. Now, the Community Foundation in Milton Keynes has joined a uh, DEI co uh, coalition uh, uh, is a UK wide coalition of charitable foundations. And the reason we've done this is to ensure that we have a model that we can follow 
and ensure that we are not tick boxing, that we are about complete change as an organization. We're following a six step model on developing an equity program, which thinks about the population of the city. It has a very clear result statement. We look at the trend lines and set some targets for ourselves. We use factor analysis to understand why things are like they are and we are developing strategy to make change happen. And finally, we are setting performance measures to make sure that we're delivering change. So in Milton Keynes, I'm not sure we have all the data and it's not in an accessible place. I don't think we have a place or an organisation that collects and supports the development of best practice. And I don't think we have the enough infrastructure organisations or support for infrastructure organisations that are supporting minority groups. For the foundation, we have adopted a diversity, equity and inclusion statement. We have uh, changed our grant process to ensure that DEI is included. We have uh, analysed our funding to ensure that we are supporting, in this instance, initially BME led and beneficiary groups but we're doing the same for uh, disability. And we are looking at developing strategic partnerships so that we can develop our understanding and improve our practice. All organisations, I believe, need to adopt a systematic approach. We must turn words and intentions and promises into actions so that we deliver some systematic change. And it is a continuous thing, it's not a one-off thing. I expect the Community Foundation in Milton Keynes to be a very different organisation as the result of the work that we do. And I also think it is the responsibility of organisations like the Community Foundation to change, not expect groups and beneficiary groups to change to suit our needs. We need to seek people out. We need to learn and we need to understand. Otherwise, how can we claim to be a community organization that supports everybody? Thank you. Hey everyone, how are you all doing? We've had some amazing speakers. I've enjoyed absolutely every speech so far. So my name is Kerry. Um, I have a rare form of muscular dystrophy. A little bit about my surroundings. Um, I am a blonde in charge of a wheelchair with a pair of purple glasses. Um, take from that what you will. Uh, a little bit about my background. I am a disability blogger and um, an activist and a campaigner. Um, I am well known for probably campaigning more for changing places toilets, which you've heard quite a few people speak about. So as a user myself, um, I fell into campaigning for changing places probably around three years ago because I was finding that it was harder to use a standard disabled toilet. They're either too small where I was being hit in the head with a baby changing table in the, in the side by a sink, maneuvering around with my husband, moving bins. It became a bit of a pain where you don't go out 
and you struggle to go out because there is nowhere to use them. So campaigning for change in places toilets was definitely something on my I want to do list. The importance of these is a difference of being able to choose whether you go out or whether you stay in. Whether you spend five hours going to MK Gallery, for instance, because they have, I would like to say, a fantastic facility. If you can go, go check it out just to see how amazing it actually is. They've even got two showers, just want to add that. Yeah, it's a case of deciding whether you go out or whether you stay in. I was going out for a period of, say, five hours. I was drinking two sips of water, which isn't healthy. It's not great. I was lucky enough to work with Tesco's, where I worked with them to build 100 changing places toilets. So we celebrated 100 within their stores in December of last year. And for a an organization and a company to make such a big impact like that means that you're able to go shopping you're able to go and just visit a family member because they're dotted around the country so you can plot where you want to go and find where these changing places are which is amazing you know these are the important to us and Milton Keynes we are so lucky to have five you know, we have one at the MK Stadium, we have one at the MK Gallery, we have one at IKEA, we, there is a pub in Bletchley, um, the cheap version of the pub I'd like to add, they have one too. So we are lucky enough, but we do need more. And we do need to include a lot more people because let's face it, the children that are disabled right now are unfortunately gonna become life-size versions of myself. So that's why we need to put more. As Ernie mentioned earlier about housing as well, that's another massive passion of mine. I've lived the world of having a non-accessible home and I've living the world now of having an accessible home. And thankfully in the pandemic that we're in right now, I have an accessible home that suits my needs. What scares me about not having an accessible home is there are people right now living in one room they have a beautiful say three bedroom house but the only access that they're able to have is in that one room that one room becomes their bathroom their living room their kitchen their bedroom because there's not enough accessible housing out there i have a one percent chance of visiting family and friends the same as anyone else in a wheelchair with a walker it's a 1% chance. I truly believe that they need to stop building with step access. And right now, they are still building homes with step access. That needs to stop. Another one, and I do apologize for all you cringers and you men out there, but I am gonna talk about a female thing that needs to change as well, is cervical screening. I massively, massively so passionate about this that doctors need to change their policy where I've lived this as well. You know, I truly believe that your story is the most powerful story that you have. And for 10 years, I fought for an abnormality screening that I had to gain access again, to be able to find out if it was something I needed to change, something I needed to work with, but it took me 10 years. And within that 10 years, two years ago, I had to unfortunately undergo being put to sleep, having a smear, having a coil removed, and making sure that everything was all right. This could have been massively avoided if there was a hoist at my local GPs, if there was a room with a bed that I was able to use. It's these little things where we are unable to, and as Anthony mentioned, it's the outside world that is the barrier, it's not us. And that's what we need to change. We need to change these barriers that we are up against to be able to live a life that we truly deserve, and we do. We deserve to live a life that 
we deserve. You know, we didn't choose to be disabled. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, do you know what? I'm going to be disabled today. Or no, no parent wakes up and says, hey, I think I'm going to have a disabled child today. I think I'm going to watch that child struggle through life. And that's not fair for anyone. You know, that we shouldn't. And I get very passionate, I'm <laughs> sorry. We shouldn't have to live that way. Why should we live a life that we do, don't deserve? We deserve to be living a life like everybody else. We deserve to walk into a restaurant or wheel into a restaurant in my case and say, hey, do you know what? There's a change in places. Fantastic. I can go with my family. I can go with my husband. I can live a life that everybody deserves. So on that note, I want everyone to share their stories because your story is the most powerful thing you have. And the only way we are going to change the outside world and the way people see us is by sharing our story and by showing them that we are human beings. We deserve to have the life that they have. We deserve to be able to enter any building, to go to a cinema and watch without having to worry about whether everybody else is understanding because we can't hear it. You know, it's it's unfair and it's outdated. Hello, my name is Jeremy Beek and I am the Corporate Equality and Policy Manager at Milton Keynes Council um, in the Chief Exec's Office. I've been working in Milton Keynes for 12 years. Um, I was the co-chair of the Disability Advisory Group. Um, personally, I have a disability um, uh, and uh, I've had a disability for a number of years. Um, I am uh, sort of greying, um, wearing glasses most of the time you see me. I'm at the moment, you'll see me from the place that most people see me at the moment. I, I haven't been into the civic offices for, for months. Um, and uh, that's partly because of another uh, issue that I have. Um, and I just want to, to bring you today some um, thoughts from Milton Keynes Council uh, perspective. Um, I just want to start by saying that um, what I want to bring are the challenges that we face as, as a, a council. They're not all the challenges, it's just some of the challenges that, um, that we have. But before I do that, I just want to, to say on behalf of my colleagues, um, how things have changed. I've been with Milton Keynes Council for over 12 years and those who have seen how services have changed really must see that um, services are more responsive, the professionalism and the best practice are there. Um, we have a diversity of professionals, uh, much more diverse than we had um, 12 years ago. Um, many of the out moded practices, some of which we've heard of today, have a long gone from the council and th thank goodness. Um, and we've tried our, uh, to deal with some of the demographic changes. Um, I uh, make an assessment every year of the budget and every year there is a lot of demographic changes as we see more people with uh, disabilities, and a whole range of disabilities, some, some of them um, coming with new practices and new services on board. Um, others um, adapting and, uh, the way that they've done things in the past to change the way that they do things. Um, just a couple of things that I am um, very proud of that I've been responsible for. I uh, instigated supporting um, uh, people with disabilities to have a voice 
um, and we 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 uh, give grants to to organisations so that that voice can be heard. Um, we also um, I instigated the accessibility guide and commissioned it eight years ago, the accessibility guide from Milton Keynes, and that does contain some information that allows people to to um, make decisions for themselves and to see what what facilities are in, at places and whether it meets their needs. We still have a lot of challenges and let me talk about that. First of all, uh, I've worked in the qualities for 30 years and I can say that uh, work in, uh, in disability equality is always a bit of a saga in a sense that you make stride forward and then you go backwards. For example, three years ago, Milton Keynes website was rated the most accessible website for a uh, government agency in the country. And yet, two years later, we had considerable problems with the accessibility of the same website. It's because th as things go forward, people meet goals, they get to a place, and then you go backwards because things don't stay as they uh, they are uh, and they don't stay and it needs constant work uh, disability uh, a lot of this work re requires us to re look at all our policies all our, our ways of doing things on a constant basis um the second thing i want to talk about is uh, uh, what i would say is true accessibility. Uh, Ernie was very right in, in pointing out, and I think Amanda did and Kerry has done to some extent, um, that actually that accessibility is about design. It's about what you put in place to start with that makes that level playing field so that anybody can use it. It's like a sliding door. Nobody, nobody that is able body uh, thinks about it but it is a, a, a door that opens for all and if we can use that as a picture that's what we need in our built uh, environment our public realm is a, a built environment that is is open to all uh, and this really needs um, accessibility by design this is this is done at the design stages and this is something that i constantly talk to my colleagues in milton keynes council about it's about getting that into the design and and at a very early stage it's not about thinking about it later but that design needs to be uh, in a way uh, it needs to be smart one of the problems we have in Milton Keynes, and that came out, I, I, I was the lead officer for the Child Poverty Commission very recently. And one of the things that we um, received back many times is how the geography of Milton Keynes works against people. It's very easy to operate in Milton Keynes if you happen to live in the center of Milton Keynes. Um, in fact, it, it is probably very accessible. But if you live on the Lakes Estate and you have a disability, or if you live on the Lakes Estate and you know don't have the uh, 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 the money to 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 pay for um, for for good transport or your own transport, I mean, it is an incredible journey to get into to the centre of Milton Keynes where most of our services are still located. Hopefully one of the things from the pandemic will be this understanding that we need to look at how we locate things, where we expect people to be uh, traveling to and how we expect people to travel. And this is something that I'm, I'm really pleased that the, the, the gallery has got this online because actually this is um, much more accessible to do it this way. Uh, so geography in Milton Keynes is 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 a, an issue. And lastly, I, I want to say that one of the challenges is to make Milton Keynes a place to fly, thrive. I tried a couple of years, oh well, about four or five years ago, to to start a work with our friends in CIL, um, are trying to make Milton Keynes accessible. 
trying to, 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 to change things by being proud in the way things are and the way people do things. Um, we, we need to continue that, that sort of work and to make Milton Keynes a place where people can thrive. And one of the aspects of that is the stigma. And we've heard that this evening from one or two, that there is still a stigma not and, and with certain disabilities, it's an incredible stigma. The stigma in mental health in everywhere, but in, let's think of Milton Keynes, is still very large. But there is stigma with other types of disability too. We need to work together across Milton Keynes to reduce stigma, to reduce the way that um, certain things are, are pushed to the side of our civic life and bring the, those aspects into our, the center of our life and celebrate our life together. And in that way, we'll thrive not just in a physical manner, but also in a, in a, in a way in which our community can come together. So those are, those are the challenges uh, that Milton Keynes Council start to see, but, but actually they're ones that we share with, with every organization and an individual here today. Thank you. Hello. Am I back on? Just waiting for the spotlighting. Um, Sam's just said we can see you are spotlit. I am spotlit. Thank you very much. Hi again, everyone. I hope you all found that as interesting and informative uh, as I did. Uh, clearly, there is so much to discuss. Um, and I was going to go around asking a few questions, uh, but sadly, I think we've run out of time. And it's a real shame also that we can't meet in the flesh and have a wider discussion. Uh, but if you do have a question or comment, please send an email to info at mkgallery.org and we'll try to get it replied for you. But we did receive a question in advance from Victoria Mitchell, who recently set up the Wolverton Gallery. Thank you for getting in touch, Victoria. And her question is as follows. How can we be inclusive during the pandemic lockdowns when there are such disparities between people being able to access online materials meetings and workshops. What other creative ways of engaging, motivating and connecting people have you tried? What has been successful? And I wish I could address that question to everybody, but I will answer it from the gallery's perspective. Um, so we obviously had to postpone Art and Us workshops because of the various lockdowns. But we were able to run a few socially distanced COVID secure sessions in our event space and learning studio between lockdowns. We also ran some Art and Us workshops online and received fantastic feedback from participants. But we are aware, of course, that this was only accessible to some of our family audiences. As a result, we're preparing some artist designed sensory boxes which will be mailed out in the coming weeks. And if this works out well, we might expand it into other programmes. Um, we will discuss this and Art and Us more generally at a sharing event, which will take place on Zoom on Saturday, the 20th of February from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So please make a note for your diaries. 
uh, the booking details are on our website. Um, but unfortunately, I think we have to wrap it up there. Uh, we said we'd finish at eight and there's just too much <laughs> to go into uh, at this point. Um, there's so much food for thought and I'm sure we will continue these conversations in other ways. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of our speakers tonight. It's been incredible to hear from all of you, uh, incredibly useful, and I've taken copious notes. Uh, and I hope, I'm sure there are lots of areas of collaboration that we can explore together in the future. So let's stay in touch and let's uh, cook up some plans together. I'd also like to thank Katie and Naomi for providing the BSL interpretation and Michelle for the live captions. And big thank you to Luke for the technical support for making it all run very smoothly and Bethany for helping to shape the whole event. In the meantime, thanks to all of you for attending. Thanks again for all of our speakers. I look forward to being in touch very soon and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Goodbye.